Thank you. So, hello everyone, and as mentioned, we are going to discuss about a little bit about security and uh, cryptographic insurances around Ansible code. So, what exactly we are going to discuss is, first of all, we are uh, going to talk a little bit about uh, the automation supply chain, what it is, why it's important, and so on. Uh, then we are going to move to securing that supply chain, and then we are going to get a little bit of uh, conclusions uh, out of this whole conversation. Very quickly about me, I've been working at INT for in the last 20 uh, for the last 20 years, mostly in consulting slash I, um, infrastructure kind of roles. I have been an Ansible user since 2013, uh, and at the time Ansible was zero dot something, uh, so. I was uh, fairly early on uh, into the Ansible thing, and then also it became way bigger. Uh, and uh, I did publish a, bun a number of books around Ansible itself. And as mentioned, I do work for Red Hat at the moment um, as a solution architect. So a few disclaimers uh, about the, the whole conversation that we are going to have today. The first one is that this does not want to be a full review of the whole um, automation security uh, conversation because obviously we don't have two days uh, to spend on this, uh, so it needs to be a primer. Uh, but uh, everything we are going to discuss is fully open source, uh, so obviously all of this can also be uh, bought with, uh, with support from Red Hat and other companies, but also it's open source, so you can pick and choose whatever you want. I will try to always mention both names, the open source version and also uh, the, the enterprise version. So, you know, you are, if you know one of the two names, you will recognize it. Uh, but everything that we are going to discuss today is both open source and also enterprise ready. The slides will have many links, but the good thing is that the last slide will have the link to the whole deck. So you can uh, see that the whole deck is a PDF and every link is clickable. So it's going to be way easier uh, if you get the ending link. Also, I think that the slides will be present into the website afterwards. So uh, you can also get them in that way. So starting with the supply chain attack, what it is uh, in general. A supply chain attack is defined as any malicious activity that targets the sourcing, the development, the distribution, and the deployment of the code itself. So the point is that we are not looking, uh, this is a kind of attack that is not looking into specific vulnerabilities about an API maybe, or something like that, but is more like uh, a vulnerability in moving the code from one place to the other and Make sure and trying to uh, you know uh, get the the weak link in between that long chain. Now, why it's important to care about supply chain security? Because until a few years ago, that was not really a thing that no one really thought about or spoke about. Uh, so, why is this important? The first reason is that we have seen in the wild that it ha it can have very disastrous um, impacts on organizations. And the reason is that if you are able to um, break uh, that supply chain in any place, then you are going to be able to determine what gets deployed into production. Um, so that really can have huge impacts. There is also another aspect which is key, which is this kind of attack can be very hard to detect. So if we are talking about a more traditional attack to APIs, for instance, you can have a WOF, um, web application uh, firewall, or other kind of software that can easily detect that kind of malicious behavior. With supply chain attacks, at the moment at least, we don't really have that many tools to detect uh, when they happen. So they can be prevented, but once they happen, it's way harder to, to then detect and, and clean up afterward. There is then uh, a big aspect about um, how to secure against those. 
and the problem is that a lot of times it's not that immediate to uh, understand how to do it. It's possible to do it, but it's not something that uh, many companies have already deployed. There is also an aspect about uh, blast radius. Um, if you do a specific attack to a specific web server, you know that that company that owns that web server will be the impacted one. Now, with supply chain security, if you attack a chain fairly early on, and maybe an open source part of the chain, you can uh, actually target a lot of different companies that have nothing to do with the attack itself. Uh, so it, you can become part of a supply chain attack even if you were not the intended target. And then there is an aspect which is nowadays it's a vector of attack that is becoming more and more frequent and more and more common. And the reason is simply that it's the one of the easiest way uh, to, to attack a company. Uh, so obviously attackers don't really care about how they attack a, a target. They only care to attack it in the easiest way possible. Uh, and today, uh, supply chain security, uh, supply chain attacks are usually the easiest way. So this is very nice, but very generic. Why should we, as automation people uh, or Ansible people, care about supply chain attacks? Why is even more important to talk about this in this Ansible? Um, part of the organizations compared to others. There is the first point, which I think it's fairly obvious to everyone, which is that usually uh, Ansible code runs as root, and usually does it in many, many systems at the same time. So if someone can compromise your Ansible code uh, early on in the chain, they can compromise basically every single system that you have, which is probably not very good. There is then an aspect about the fact that as an Ansible community, uh, we have not done a lot of work to uh, secure our chains in general and many companies as well. Uh, but this is obviously a problem because as we discussed, the, the attackers usually don't really care about how they attack their target. They only care to do it in the easiest possible way. And then there is another aspect, which is that a lot of times, companies don't even know what is their supply chain uh, for Ansible code or automation code in general because they think it's something, but actually it's way more complex than what they think. So if we move to analyze a little bit the supply chain itself, um, we can see that there are a lot of different supply chains obviously that companies can have uh, within Ansible, uh, for Ansible within their, their premises. But there are some patterns that I think are fairly common. And the reason is that a lot of the deployments within companies of Ansible code goes usually in a certain way. And it usually it starts with the very initial, uh, how I would define it, automation workflow, which is something like this. You have a developer that deploys code on some machines, and that's it. Usually it's doing it on their laptop. Hopefully their manager knows it, that they are doing it. Uh, sometimes their manager don't, uh, but that's not the point. The point is that in this case, the developer is writing code on their laptop and then executing it directly from their laptop with the target of that nodes that they are trying to automate. In this case, there is no real supply chain risk because the laptop itself um, is where the developer writes the code and runs the code, so the code never moves effectively. And the connection from the developer machine to the nodes usually is SSH, so, I mean, obviously everything can be broken, uh, and we know that SSH with XL, for instance, uh, vulnerability uh, got very close to be broken, um, but actually SSH is a usually fairly strong protocol. The problem though is that usually this does not last too long because obviously as soon as their manager realizes that that person is way more efficient uh, and productive than their colleagues, they want the whole team to use Ansible. 
and therefore usually what happens is that we move to a more scalable approach and usually this is the first uh, attempt so effectively we do have whoops something happened okay it's back uh, so we have a number of developers uh, that are the members of the team. Everyone does their commits, they push it to Git, and the same developer as before pulls the, the commit uh, from Git and then runs it. Now, obviously, this is a little bit more scalable, so the manager is happy, everyone is happy, uh, and so on. There is one small problem, which is that our developer at a certain point need to go um, on holiday. So obviously this model does not really scale too much. Uh, so usually the solution is give the same privilege or task to other developers as well, so that basically as long as you have at least one of those people um, in the office, they can do deployments. But this should, th it's like a stepping stone, but usually it does not last too long. Because obviously this, creates a lot of issues because it's like, oh, um, th those two people basically needs to synchronize. It's like, oh, uh, should I deploy it? Should you deploy it? Oh, uh, who deployed it yesterday? Um, that something happened, I don't know. And then maybe the, lo the logs are also lost. Uh, so I it's something, but it's not really a, a real stable solution. Usually the solution is to put a controller instead of those people. And there are, well, there is one major controller, which is AWX in its open source version um, and uh, Red Hat Automation, uh, Ansible Automation controller into their uh, the enterprise version. Uh, but still, it's the same code. So everything that applies to one applies to the other one as well. And the way it works is that basically everyone has a login into that software and they can run the, the code and all the logs are kept all the, uh, the credentials are kept in secrets and everything is nice now the issue though is that a lot of times I speak with companies uh, and they are like hey, yeah our organization is something like this and I'm like are you sure because I don't think that's the reality of it usually what they have is something more similar to this, where there are a bunch of people, usually outside your organization, that write a number of collections that your developer then use to write their uh, automation code. And this is a critical point because obviously, if someone compromises those collections, then we have a problem. Because we are pulling code from outside the organization, maybe without checking it too much, um, and yeah, things can go very wrong. Because as we said before, everything here is run as root on many of your machines. So it might have some consequences. So my suggestion is usually to move to a little bit better approach, first of all, before trying to secure it in a cryptographic way. It's like, let's try to move things around so that we can then secure it better. So the first thing I suggest is to move the, the collections from the developer responsibility to someone that checks that collection and put them into an automation hub. Uh, automation hub, there are two versions. The upstream version is called uh, Galaxy NG, and then there is the Ansible, uh, Red Hat Ansible automation hub, which is the part of the uh, enterprise version, but same thing as before, same code, so uh, exactly the same things that work for one work for the other. So obviously this is better, and is obviously even better if that person actually checks what they are pulling. Um, so the way it works here is that obviously we de responsabilize the developers to check, because obviously they just consume what the company provides, and then there is someone in the company that is tasked to check. There is another thing that we can also improve uh, because execution environments have been around for the last few years. They are very, very useful. Uh, so since we 
oops, um, before that, um, another thing we can actually do is add a CI uh, step so that basically um, we can do some CIs on the collections uh, before running them. And as I was saying, um, execution environments are very, very useful. So they can also be stored into the automation hub. So obviously it does make sense to uh, consider them as well, also because they can potentially be a source of untrusted software if you don't check. So if you structure properly your, um, your pipeline, uh, aut automation code pipeline, and you map it properly, it should look something like this. Maybe it's not exactly like this, but on general terms is going to be something like this. Now that we have a sensible pipeline and that uh, we have mapped it, hopefully, uh, we can think about how to make it more secure. Because as of now, we only have this whole thing, but it's not more secure than it was before. Now, the, as we discussed at the beginning, we are going to focus on supply chain security. So the, to secure the movement of code in between steps. We are not going to focus on how to harden, I don't know, the controller or the automation hub. That's a different kind of conversation. So the first thing that we can notice is that we do have a number of committers here, Git and SCI. So it could make sense to try to secure this area. Uh, obviously we can secure, there, there are different ways to secure a supply chain. You have to think a little bit about what exactly do you want to ensure. In this scenario, I would suggest to put the CI as a blocking step uh, from a cryptographical standpoint, so that basically we can be sure that every part of the code pass through the CI. That CI can be GitHub Action, can be GitLab, whatever is called their CI, can be Jenkins, Tecton, whatever CI you have in your organization will work. Because in the end it's, you know, you will put uh, some work, um, some tasks there, maybe some testing, uh, some validation and so on. So to secure that Git part, we can sign Git commits. This is a thing that has been around for many, many years at this point. It's not Ansible specific. You can sign any Git commit. Uh, Git mm, Ansible is using it, so you can uh, sign Git commit with Ansible code. Now the way you do it is with the Git commit command with the dash s, capitalized s. That uh, applies a signature. Now you can also change your configuration, uh, Git configuration file so that it automatically applies the signature every time if you don't want to remember the dash s. Uh, there is a, a caveat here, uh, which is, as everything we are going to discuss, there are some setup to do. So in this case, you have to create keys, uh, uh, cryptographic keys, and also, um, you know, you will need to decide how to manage those. So who creates those keys? Who access this key? Are those keys created by the single developer? or are they created by a single person within the organization and then distributed? Are those keys on the physical machine of the developer? Are those keys on a UV key or you know, any other kind of hardware token? So there are some decisions to be made here. But there is also a link with the specific details uh, on all the things to uh, remember um, and set up to do this kind of uh, signing. Now, we have the signing sign con, um, con, commits, so we now need to validate those. To do this, we can also uh, leverage the, the git command itself. We can do verify commit and then the commit ID, and it will verify the, uh, the commit signature. Now, there is, as usual, the, the link to the documentation. Um, there is a big caveat here, which is you need to decide how do you trust your developer keys? Wh what is the policy be behind that? Uh, but that's more like a political organizational 
uh, topic more than a technical one. Because te technically speaking, what you will need is a chain, um, a keychain with all the keys that are approved into that chain, and then you can uh, simply validate uh, that that commit has been signed by one of those keys. Now, this was the image before. If we do the signing part, obviously at the developer stage, so on the developer laptop or with a physical token by the developer itself, and we do the validation at the CI level, what we will we'll get is something like this, where basically we have secured that part of the supply chain because we are sure that whatever was here is also here. Okay? So we still have a lot of boxes that are outside that green zone. To extend that green zone, we can put security around this part, so from the CI to the controller, so that basically we can ensure that whatever was in the CI is the same thing that we are going to run from the controller itself. So to do this, we can sign the Ansible projects uh, that are in, that in those Git repos. To do this, uh, we can use the Ansible-sign uh, project, and then GPG sign, and then the, the folder. So if you are already in the folder of the project, it's dot, Aussie, uh, it's a relative path, uh, but you can also do it in a different uh, path, it's the same. And there is the, the documentation uh, on exactly all the parameters, because as before, you will have different uh, GPG keys in this step compared to the previous ones. Uh, otherwise, you have the risk that one of your developers signs um, th their commits or potentially the projects while we expect the CI to sign the project, not the developers. Uh, so obviously you will have different keys here and you have to decide uh, who creates the key, how it gets created, does it get rotated every how much time, does it needs to be rotated, and all those policies around us. To validate it, uh, you can either do it manually so uh, if you are, for instance, on your uh, devel developer laptop, you can validate that the, the, the project has been signed properly. And to do this, you can use the uh, same command, Ansible sign project, but GPG verify instead of GPG sign, uh, and then the path as well. Uh, or it can be done on AWX or Ansible Automation Controller itself. So immediately before running it, the controller can check if the, the signature was okay, is okay or not. Um, and, you know, there is the usual link to uh, the whole documentation on exactly how to do this. So, if we sign it in the CI get and va validate it into the controller, we get something like this. Now, obviously, we are re-signing here which means that, as we discussed uh, before, this means that all code, we are sure, from a cryptographical standpoint, that goes through the CI, because the developer cannot sign a code that is then uh, validated by the control itself. So we are sure that whatever the developer do arrives to the CI, the CI validates their signatures, resigns, and the controller checks for the CI signatures. Now, obviously, your CI needs to be secure. Because if your CI uh, machine or system gets compromised, the whole thing obviously breaks. Uh, the supply chain security, as we were saying at the beginning, is not a replacement for the other kind of security. It's just something more you should be doing. So we can now be sure that our part of the code is correct, but we still are importing the collections from outside, and a bunch of other things. So we still have a lot of work to do here. The first thing that we can secure are the collection themselves. As usual, we are going to first sign them and then to validate them. On the signatures part, we do have a few options. So we can do it manually. And in this case, the command is GPG simply. So we are just going to use GPG itself to create a signature of uh, the collection. 
We can also do it manually uh, with on Galaxy NG or a Private Automation Hub if you are using it from the UI itself. Or uh, we can do it um, within the uh, approval stage um, into uh, Galaxy NG or um, Ansible Automation Hub uh, because if you are using uh, those software, you can set them up so that basically you have an approver. Someone uploads a, a collection and then it's not visible until an approver approves it. And the signature can be put in that approval stage as part of the approval stage itself. Also, it's possible to import a signature from another step, a previous step, basically. So what we can do, uh, and there are obviously the, the, the usual link, um, we can then validate uh, the collections uh, either via Ansible Galaxy, so uh, the command line utility. So if you are downloading on your laptop a collection, you can check that effectively that collection was properly signed. But also on Ansible build, so if you are building execution environments with Ansible build uh, and you are putting collections into execution environments, it's important to check before you do that, that those collections are trustworthy. Uh, and that is part of the um, Ansible builder uh, create command, so that's the usual execution environment creation command. The only difference is that you are going to add the dash dash galaxy keyring option and obviously pass a keyring uh, and that's enough to ensure that ex uh, Ansible Builder will check all the collections that are properly signed by at least one key in that string. But also uh, it's possible to do it automatically on AWX or Ansible Automation Controller uh, at the execution step basically. Uh, with the usual links as well. So what we get here is that what we can do is get where if we get the collections from someone that is signing already the collection, we can check that that signature is correct. So if we trust the, the original creator of the, the collection, we can inherit that signature, but also that our person that is validating the collections can also check um, sign them. And so all our collection into the automation hub will be signed properly. And we can therefore check them on uh, the build of execution environments as well as on the controller itself. So this is the picture we get, basically. And obviously not all Collections will be signed if you get a collection from, I don't know, somewhere in the community, probably they are not signed. Uh, but that's also a sign that, it's, you know, a, a clear indication that you should check them. In the other hand, if you have a software provider uh, that is providing you some collections, those might be uh, already signed. And since you already have a relationship with that company, you might want to trust them or not. That's up to you. You can obviously always double check the, uh, their work as well. Now, there is one step uh, that is missing, which is we are checking the collections when they enter into execution environments, but we are not really checking if the execution environments that get built are the one that we can we then run. Obviously, that's a critical point because, as I said, we are going to run root level uh, comments into those uh, images. So good thing is that execution environments in the end are just containers. So we can use all the security around uh, container supply chain security for our execution environments. So first of all, we will need to sign them and we can do it manually with Scopio. Scopio is part of the Podman uh, utility set. That's the, the common. Basically, we just uh, do a standalone sign uh, of the, the image itself. We can do it via uh, Podman itself uh, while doing the push. So 
you do podman push, dash dash uh, sign by, you put the email, uh, you also have to have a certificate for that email configured on your machine. They will, uh, it will be signed while uploaded. Uh, also, uh, you can do it uh, with Galaxy NG or uh, Private Automation Hub manually on the UI. So uh, you first upload it uh, on the Galaxy NG or Private Automation Hub and then you just click sign. Or um, when the, uh, every image gets uh, pushed on uh, Galaxy NG or Private Automation Hub, in that moment you can put the signature there. And as previously, the, the, the bunch of links uh, around how exactly do, uh, to do the, that. Once we have done the signature part, we will need to do the validation part. And as before, luckily, the whole Podman and Docker space is fairly straightforward uh, in validating this. And there is a concept that is not very well uh, known or used uh, into those utilities that is called container policy. You can basically set a bunch of policies that all containers will need to oblige to to be run on that host. And one of those policy uh, is the, the fact that that container needs to be signed by a certain key or a, certain, a key in a certain set. So once we also add uh, those kind of uh, assurances, what we get is something like this. So we also have added the trust in, uh, from the execution environment on the automation hub and then from the automation hub to the controller. So that in this way, we can be sure that all components um, from the beginning to the end in our supply chain have been validated. Now, as usual, this does not mean full security. If this person uh, puts wrong code, that wrong code will go through uh, and it will go to production. Obviously, that this is not a replacement for CI, for testing, for all the other stuff that you usually do. It's, something, it's simply something that guarantees you or makes it way more probable, at least, um, that whatever code those people and those people wrote is exactly what you get in production. Now, a few conclusions um, on this. First of all, Aut uh, automation can be a very interesting target for supply chain attacks, I would argue for any kind of attacks, um, but obviously supply chain attacks um, are the ones that we are talking about today. There is uh, an aspect about supply chain uh, for automation code, which they tend to be very long chains, and a lot of times is not that clear to the people that are trying to make them save, what exactly is that supply chain? So the first step is always map exactly what's the supply chain for your, uh, your code. And then once you have done it, you can um, decide how to make it safer and then also you know, implement the security aspects. And there are a lot of tools uh, that help you uh, to do all those uh, chain of sign validation, sign validation. Um, there are different tools, uh, which is, I would argue, not great. Uh, if we had uh, one tool that would be able to, automa to automatically do all different steps, would be easier. Uh, but still, we do have a lot of tools, and all those tools, in reality, are all abstraction on GPG. Uh, so in theory, you can do them all with simple GPG, uh, but obviously GPG commands are not that user-friendly, uh, so uh, the others tend to be just abstraction layers on top of, on top of GPG. So this is uh, my final slide with the link to the presentation itself so that uh, you can click on links uh, and my contacts. Now, if there are questions, um, we can have them on now. I think we still have 10 minutes. Yep. 
um, the question is about if I know about any recent attacks uh, using suppl uh, an automation supply chain uh, in the real world. Now, as far as I'm aware, no. But um, the, one of the problems with the attacks uh, is that in theory, at least in Europe, uh, there is the law that says that if you are attacked as a company, you should uh, inform the, the state and a bunch of other things but we know that the, the reality is not always that linear. Uh, and even when that happens, usually they don't disclose the attack vector. Uh, so the fact that I am not aware of any does not mean that they did not happen. Uh, I had a couple of conversations with people uh, that were also the developers of many of those tools. And from things that they said, I would assume that they were aware of attacks that happened uh, exactly on those kind of things. Uh, but then obviously there is a lot of NDAs going on. So it's very hard to discuss uh, freely about specific attacks. Okay. I don't think there are other questions, but uh, in other case, I'll be around. Uh, so mm, if you have other questions later, uh, come find me. Thank you. Thank you.